My name is Tanya Vavilova, and this here, if you can see, is Rusty. I'm going to do a reading for you from my book, We Are Speaking in Code, that came out in March. The first essay that I have for you is called Dog People, and it's about the human canine relationship and about all the dogs that I've ever known and loved. Uh, even Rusty features in it, uh, although sometimes he bites. Look at him. Oh, there's Rusty. Uh, okay, so, and this particular extract that I'm going to read introduces Wesley, who is a Kelpie Doberman cross that I looked after when I house sat in Coogee. Here we go. Wesley likes drinking out of my water glass. How this started, I don't know. But one time, we're both sitting on the couch. I'm reading a book. And he leans across the coffee table, sticks his snout in my cup, and laps up the water with his pink tongue. When he leans back casually and resettles on the couch, I realise that he's done this before. I've since discovered that dogs and cats quite like drinking out of water glasses. I've offered my glass to countless dogs when, for whatever reason, no bowl or other receptacle was handy. You'll catch worms, my flatmate tells me. I wouldn't worry, I say. I always rinse the glass. A proud mongrel, black and burnt butter, soft eyes and long snout. I like to press my cheek against his, but he doesn't like that and will try to nip me if I try. I've learnt a lot about his likes, chasing waves, belly rubs and dislikes, insects, peanut butter, over the months we've run wild together. Wesley is a vocal beast, whimpering, sighing, howling, barking, a rescue dog, who knows what horrors he suffered in his childhood. He looks at me like he knows all about the terrible ways we treat animals, has first-hand knowledge. A typical conversation goes like this. Wes sighs. Life's hard, hey, I say. Another despairing sigh. I know, my little goose, I know. He raises his snout, shows me his big, wet eyes. I give him a liver snap. One Sunday morning when I run into the courtyard, eyes wide like frisbees, smiling, arms flapping, my flatmate says, where's the dog? What? I ask. That's your, I'm excited there's a dog face, she says. Oh. There is no dog. When I see a dog bounding towards me, I feel uncomplicated joy. It's as close to love, to awe as I get. Humans, even good ones, don't inspire the same feelings in me. Sometimes I don't answer the door or I duck into a shop when I see someone I know, even someone I like, walking in my direction. My colleague says, you should absolutely get a dog. It will improve your quality of life. My flatmates and our landlord still need convincing. I wonder if I should just bring a dog home without seeking permission and wait for everyone to fall in love. My mother warns, they'll kick you out. Here's the other thing. I'm allergic to dogs. The more time I spend with them, the more severe my allergic reaction is. I get hives, and this is after taking antihistamines. I love canines too much to care, even though around them I'm itchy and red-eyed and sometimes my breathing is laboured. Despite all this, and against doctor's orders, I house it, I pat strangers' dogs, I search for rescue pups. A greyhound up for adoption has acidosis or excess acid in the blood. His forever home must have a clam-shaped plastic pool for summer. 
I go outside to look at the proportions of our inner city courtyard. I think I could, maybe, rig up an awning between the clothesline and the side fence and the pool could go there in the shade. Why does it have to be clam-shaped? My flatmate asks. I say, that's what Mac is used to, but I guess a kidney-shaped pool would be okay too. So as you can see, I now do have a dog, uh, Rusty, and I guess that illustrates the long process of writing and publishing a book. That particular essay I would have written maybe two years ago, and that was long before Rusty came into our lives. We've had him for about six months. Um, he's bitten countless strangers, um, eaten all the delicious things that we like to eat here. And he's been very affectionate and sweet. And he's, he's found his uh, forever home. We actually just took him for a bike ride, put him in a milk crate on the back. I'll stop rambling and read another essay. So this is the last excerpt that I'll read. It's from an essay about my grandmother called Pineapples and Privation. Uh, it came out of the audio recordings that my grandmother made shortly before her death. Uh, and I had the chance to sift through them. And as far as I know, I'm the only one in my family who's listened to all of the recordings. They were in Russian. And so there was also a process of translation um, and research and trying to get to the, get to the bottom um, of some of the, some of the stories and some of the places and some of the people that my grandmother mentioned in those recordings. So where, so this is a, um, so I'm going to start this essay halfway through. This is after my grandmother was uh, diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Even after her diagnosis, Irina made regular trips to her local op shops where she picked up dresses she thought I'd like. A black dress with polka dots. I loved it instantly and wore it to a hospital appointments and when I visited. Oh, that's interesting. So when you read your book for the first time, you also uh, realize uh, that there are uh, typos or something missing. Um, so I will just forge ahead, I think. No, I'm going to move on. I'm going to start from this section here. In another recording I listened to, there is occasional laughter, interjections from my mother who is in the hospital room this time too. I can almost pretend I am sitting in Irina's living room, eavesdropping on their conversation. Apparently Grisha, my grandmother's brother, had trouble with pronunciation at school, had trouble with his letters. World War II led to a break in schooling. Irina only learnt to read in the fourth grade and a lot of the kids in the seventh grade were older than usual. A few were 17. The older boys used to extinguish cigarette butts on Grisha's back in the toilet block. He was seven or eight at the time. My babushka still remembers the surname of the lead bully, almost spits it out, Gushin. A plucky 13 or 14 year old, she took him aside and said, if you come near my brother again, I will smear you against the wall. Later that night, riding her bike on a deserted road, Gushin accosted her with a razor blade he took out of his pocket. You wanna talk now, he said. They fought in the middle of the road. Irina scratched and hit and howled, her plaits coming undone, and she defeated him. Afterwards, Gushin never set foot near Grisha again and was even warily polite to my babushka. She was rattled for days, but there is pride in her retelling of the story that day. I like these tales of family loyalty and bravery. 
Not only do they reveal someone's nature in crisis, but also remind me that I'm in safe hands. We are a family of actions and few words. It's the doing, help with the shopping, medical appointments, lifts and drop-offs, help moving house, that matters in our family. I can't stand the simplicity and prescription of the so-called five languages of love, but if there is a shred of truth in it, it might be why, whenever I visited my babushka, I'd stop to buy some irises at the florist. I did this once or twice. Or to pick up some ice cream. I did this often on my way, even when I didn't have two coins to rub together. I ring my father one night to ask him about the road trip Irina took around Australia in the late 90s. There is so much missing from the recordings, so much I was too young to remember. Irina had a boyfriend at the time, Vasily, who my parents referred to as her friend. One day, he parked his van outside our house in Maryong and invited my father to take a look inside. It was very cosy, my father remembers, very functional. Vasily had carefully and lovingly converted his panel van, putting in a makeshift bed and stove. My babushka was in her mid-60s when they set off north from the western suburbs of Sydney, along the coast, all the way to Cairns. No one can remember exactly how long they were away, but my mother's guess is a few months. My father defers to my mother. He tells me a story, so my father tells me a story about pineapples. Neither he nor my mother remembers the geography or other details, so what follows is a recreation of sorts. In Queensland, Irina and Vasily stocked up on the sweetest and ripest fruit, and driving along open roads, probably for days, probably into the fruit fly control zone, was stopped by stern border control officers. Devastated, my babushka, who hated waste, hated wasting food above all else, asked Vasily to reverse and pull over on the side of the road. They sat in the parked van with the windows rolled down and ate as many pineapples as they could, the tang and sweetness of the fruit mixing with the summer heat and the dust fruit juice dripping down their chins and elbows, tossing the pineapple crowns into a plastic bag until there was no fruit left and they could, without regret, cross the border. Thank you so much for listening to my reading. Uh, it was so nice to do it for you. And um, this is me and Rusty. He doesn't look very happy being lifted up. Um, we're signing off. Thanks so much.